Patrick and I are uh, two of the three co-founders of Veo Robotics. Um, Veo Robotics is, uh, what we do is we bring perception and intelligence to industrial robots so that they can collaborate safely with humans. Um, so we've got essentially uh, start with talking a little bit about industrial robots. Yeah, so the kinds of robots we're talking about are the robots that you would see, for example, in an automobile factory or uh, a durable goods factory, durable goods being anything from washing machines and refrigerators to cars to air conditioners or whatever. And these robots are the traditional industrial robots that have existed for almost 50 years. And what they're there for is to take care of essentially tasks that require some superhuman abilities. Uh, they can lift very heavy things. They can move very fast. Uh, they can do the same thing over and over again for a long time. And uh, to give you a little bit of perspective, uh, when I was 19, and you can see I'm not 19 anymore, I programmed my first industrial robot when I uh, was uh, an undergraduate at MIT. I uh, was in charge of interfacing a new industrial robot to our Lisp machines. And that robot is, was not so different from the ones you see on the screen, except in one regard. The ones you see on the screen are very highly optimized. They have the same kind of uh, geometry, the same number of joints, they're intended for the same kinds of tasks. But robots today, for many of the big four uh, industrial robot manufacturers, they can run for 100,000 hours operating at sub-millimeter accuracy. So one way to think about that is that that's about 24 hours a day, seven days a week for 10 years. So these are machines. Uh, they're machine tools. Uh, but they are machine tools that are highly evolved and extremely durable. And we work with all of the big four uh, industrial robot manufacturers because uh, what we are doing is uh, essentially adding brains and eyes to those robots so that they actually know where you are and can work together with you. And uh, the reason this is important is that while these robots have capabilities that are in many ways far beyond the capabilities of the human body, you know, one thing you learn over the course of a 20-year career in robotics um, is that people are absolutely amazing. There are all kinds of things that people do every day without even thinking about it that are way beyond the capabilities of even the most advanced robots today. Um, so here's a very simple example that many of you here may be directly familiar with that I often find is an interesting illustration. Um, applying mascara. So if you break this task down, what you're talking about is first you have visual circling with sub-millimeter precision, then you have force feedback at the level of the deflection of a human eyelash. You then are assessing the thickness of a coating that's a few microns thick, adjusting subsequent trajectory to ensure an even coating across all eyelashes. And you're doing this with a pointy object held millimeters away from a human eyeball. So if you think about trying to automate that task, it's incredibly daunting. But, you know, millions of people all over the world do this every day without even thinking about it. So what this means in an industrial setting is that there are hundreds of tasks that are done every day in factories by what we would consider to be low-skilled workers that are well beyond the capabilities of even the most advanced automation. Um, and it's certainly an interesting academic debate of whether, you know, someday robots will achieve this level of performance, but in all practical terms, for the foreseeable future, there are still going to be millions of tasks that can only be done by humans, and then many, many more tasks for which human labor is still the most cost-effective and sensible solution, and especially, that is especially true in a rapidly changing situation. Automating a robot to do one specific task in a fixed environment over and over and over again is difficult but possible. A person can be trained in a completely new task in a matter of minutes or hours, and there's just no way that robots are going to have that kind of flexibility um, anytime soon. Um, but so, you know, human labor is, is absolutely critical in manufacturing, but um, there's a challenge there. 
Yeah, so uh, what you see here is a very typical uh, thing you'd see in any factory where you've got any big automatic machinery. And there are regulations around it. Uh, OSHA, for example, inspects manufacturing environments in the United States to make sure that they're safe. In the European Union, you have the EU machine directive that also uh, you know, says if you're not standards compliant, you can't install any uh, automated machinery into the factory because it's very important to keep workers safe. Uh, the result of that is that any big robot can't actually be close to a person today. And if you think about it, you know, think about a farmer working with a horse uh, who pulls the plow. That farmer can be close to the horse. The horse is, of course, very big, and horses, if they're panicked, uh, can be quite dangerous. But the horse is aware of where the person is, and the horse, uh, therefore, can be careful not to step on the person, uh, you know, crush you against a stable wall or something like that. That's not true of robots today, and as a result, even though robots can do these superhuman tasks, for example, they have a really easy time of doing a lot of stuff in automotive assembly that's done by hand today, like putting a door on. You just do that with a lift assist device, or installing the seats in a car. You know, you just have to push around this big heavy thing that carries the seats. Uh, all these kinds of tasks aren't really fun for workers in the factory, but the worker has to be there. Why? For the reasons that Clara was just talking about. There's a lot of important stuff that goes on in final assembly that you can't do with any robot. You know those wiring harnesses that you'd see if you looked under the dash of your car, or you know you get inside the back of your refrigerator, they're wiring harnesses and they gotta be connected with connectors. There aren't any robots in the world that can take a couple of dangling pieces of wire with connectors on the end and bring them together. That's gotta be a person. And any quality control step, anything that you want to do that uh, requires changing the process, and the inside of factories constantly change, um, that requires a human. Your best and most flexible and most intelligent resource inside a factory is a human worker. And if you have to change something, you just say to the human worker, hey, look, this is what we're doing. Could you watch out for this? And then the human worker can, can get in there and deal with that. So humans aren't going away from the factory anytime soon, but right now, they can't get close to that robot the way a farmer can get close to a plow horse. And so collaboration between humans and robots is something that people really, that manufacturing engineers really want robots to be able to do. And that's why um, the, there's so a uh, sort of new class of robots that are called collaborative robots. Um, and those robots have been very successful in the marketplace. Yeah, so uh, what you can see on the left side of the screen there is a little UR3 that's made by Universal Robots, which is a Danish company owned by Teradyne, uh, Teradyne uh, a Boston area company. Um, but that robot is collaborative and it's safe for human interaction. Uh, and, and Universal Robots and Rethink Robotics, another Boston area company, have pioneered the use of collaborative robots. And, and that growth has taken off extremely quickly. If you look in the upper right hand corner, there's a thing that says CAGR equals 67%. That means the compound annual growth rate of uh, the sales of these robots has been 67% increasing every year. Now, if you could get that kind of interest in your bank account, you'd be very happy. Um, but it started from zero around 2012, and so it's grown very fast, but it can only serve a tiny fraction of all the needs that we have to use robots out there in the world. You can see the rest of that circle. The rest of that circle is about two and a half million robots. So far, we're only at around 50,000 collaborative robots, and the reason for that is that they uh, are limited in many ways. So, yeah, so we pose this question of, since collaboration between robots and humans is so great, why are all robots not collaborative? And essentially, the reason for that is that the, the, the technology that allowed that first generation of collaborative robots to be safe is fundamentally limited to small, slow, lightweight robots. The, what makes those robots safe is that they have force sensing in their joints. 
so that when the robot hits somebody, it detects the collision and stops. So that works fine if the robot's not very strong to begin with. But when you start working with robots of the size and scale of the ones that you know we were looking at earlier, these are robots that themselves weigh multiple tons that can move two meters a second, carry you know hundreds of kilograms of material, you don't want to wait for that robot to hit you before it detects a collision and stops. So the only way to make that kind of a robot safe and collaborative is essentially to make it perceptive and intelligent. Um, and this is what we are doing at Veo. We are using modern time of flight 3D sensing to and, and um, computer vision and GPU accelerated algorithms to monitor the space around the robot, to understand what's going on in the work cell. Our system can see, okay, I can see the robot here. I see the work piece that that robot is carrying. I see the people moving around. And then we can actually calculate and instantaneously how fast is it safe for the robot to go at that very moment? And we can dynamically control the speed of the robot so that the person and the robot are always safe. Um, and I think actually what we'd like to do now is we have a video of our prototype system working in our lab um, with uh, my, my blonde twin. And so if we could show that video now, um, you could this see. This is an example of a action. typical assembly task in a factory. In this case, we're putting doors on a refrigerator. If this task was to be automated with existing technology, it would have to be a very complicated work cell involving multiple robots. The entire area would have to be caged to prevent any people from getting anywhere near the automated system. And there would be a lot of additional automation and other pieces of equipment that would be necessary to keep the whole system running. Using the Veil system, it's possible for a person and a robot to work together to get this job done in a very straightforward manner. Since we're monitoring the entire 3D area in high resolution, it's not even necessary for an entire person to get near the robot. It's enough to just hold out your hand. On the screen over here, you can see the red line that represents the shortest distance between any point on the robot and any object in the environment. When it's carrying the door, the robot is now monitoring not just the robot itself, but also the workpiece, so that it's going to control speed not just based on whether someone's near the robot, but whether someone's near the workpiece that the robot is carrying. Once the robot is holding the door in place, the person can come in and do the parts of the task that require human dexterity. essentially the core of, of what we're building. Yeah, so uh, funny story. Claire and I uh, met years ago. I was president at Rethink Robotics, and uh, Clara was doing some consulting for us on product management. And that's when I had the uh, idea for the company. It was visiting the BMW plant in Spartanburg. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, just seeing all these great robots that the manufacturing engineers there love. Uh, and being asked again and again, um, gosh, could, could the robot you're thinking of building, one of these first generation collaborative robots, could it help us with this? And I'd have to say no, because it's going to be too slow, too weak. Could it help us with that? No, it's going to have to be too slow, too weak. And it happened again and again, and I started thinking, well, what about using vision? Uh, you know, and, and unfortunately, the, the hardware technology at the time wasn't up to the task. But uh, as a result, we've engaged very heavily with automotive manufacturers, both in the United States and Europe, and we work closely with those people. So we wanted, actually, to uh, you know, show a task where we're putting together a refrigerator. Uh, not quite. <laughs> we would have liked to do that, but. Well, we, so the, the originally, the task that inspired you know, this, this, really this company, as Patrick was saying, was putting an instrument panel in a car. But with our, you know, our little setup in, in West Cambridge, we couldn't put a car inside an office building. So we were looking for something a little more practical. So we said, all right, well, we want to assemble another fairly large piece of equipment. Oh, and we were having this conversation in the kitchen. So we said, oh, hey, how about a refrigerator? Um, so we put together this video just as an example of something you could do with a system like this. And then you know, we, we sent this out to a lot of folks in the manufacturing world. Um, and one particular customer got a hold of it um, and then called us up 
and they said, hey, we make refrigerators. <laughs> it's a plant in South Carolina that makes about two million refrigerators a year. And they also make you know, stoves and other white goods in Tennessee, so uh, now we, we work with them. So uh, it turns out that the things that you want to do in car plants uh, also happen in other places. Yeah, so we were just down there a couple weeks ago at the actual refrigerator factory um, and talking to them about how to install our system in, in their plant. Um, so this, you know, this, this project that we're working on now, building the, the eyes and the brains for industrial robots, um, is, is the first step towards what we think is really the next generation of manufacturing. Yeah, uh, you know, I gave the example of the farmer who has a plow being able to work closely with a horse. And that, you know, when you think about it, um, that, that kind of fluid interaction uh, doesn't exist in factories right now. Because there are all these wonderful machines and they make uh, our, our modern lives possible. We would all be uh, subsistence farmers if we didn't have things like machines and automation. Uh, but right now, those machines need to be kept separate from people. In the future, what we'd like to create is an environment in which you're at home in this world uh, that also has machines in it, in which production labor in a factory, for example, can move around very fluidly, and the machines are responsive to your presence. They see that you're there, they respect that you're there, they're not going to bump into you, and now you can get in there and, and do the things that require human intelligence, human judgment, human dexterity, and you can rely on the robots to do the things that are really, you know, more, uh, you know, requirements of brute force and repeatability and, and just, uh, you know, using muscle 24-7. So, uh, we think there's actually a, a, a really uh, very positive angle to this automation stuff. It uh, lets humans do what humans, only humans can do, and it lets the machines help us in doing those things. Yeah. work you are doing is fantastic, so congratulations and join me in a round of applause for our speakers today. Oh, you want to? We, we do have one more thing to okay, add. Okay, last thing that I want to mention is that uh, we are hiring. We are looking oh, for... Oh, that's uh, very important to announce. Please, go ahead. Some, uh, some top-notch uh, software and electrical engineers, so if you or anyone you know is in those fields, please go to veilbot.com and take a look. Uh, we would love people to join our team. Thank you very much. Thanks very much.